Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, driverless cars are the next frontier, but there's a controversy brewing within the industry about how to keep them safe. We're going to hear from BlackBerry CEO John Chen, who thinks expecting the driver to monitor them is irrational. Plus, investors pour more than $300 million in Robinhood's latest funding round, valuing it more than $5.5 billion. We will discuss the rapid rise with co-founder Baju Bhatt. And a trove of thousands of Russian-backed Facebook ads are made public for the first time, showing that Russia's main goal was provoking discontent in the United States, leading to the election of Donald Trump. But first, to our top story. The White House is hosting officials from over 40 companies for a summit on artificial intelligence. And plenty of tech giants got the invitation, including Facebook, Amazon, Alphabet, Microsoft, and more. On the agenda, addressing national research development in the field, AI's impact on the workforce, regulation, and innovation. And of course, China's plan to dominate AI by 2030. China is not the only country with a national strategy on AI. Both France and Canada have also announced plans for how their countries will tackle the field. I want to bring in Bloomberg's Ben Brody in D.C., who covers tech lobbying for Bloomberg. And in Seattle, we've got Spencer Soper, who covers Amazon. First of all, Spencer, this is the first time that Amazon is going to the White House since those tweets from President Trump shooting barbs at the company. What's the state of the tensions, and do we expect this will ease them? Yeah, there are some signs of those tensions easing. In, in addition to this invitation, there was even um, uh, the first lady, Melania Trump, unveiled her initiative, Be Best, this kind of anti-cyberbullying, anti-opioid campaign. And, and Amazon even got a shout out uh, during that unveiling. So uh, the Trump tweets at Amazon have, have, have settled for now. And along with that uh, little gesture with the with the first lady's initiative, seems like there could be a, a, a cooling of of, uh, of the tension. And is there any signal from anyone other than the president himself, you know, from within the administration that Amazon in particular has something to worry about? Um, I mean, there's always a, there's. Uh, Regulatory concerns about big tech, and so Amazon always gets lumped in, lumped in with that. But uh, and and then on the on the postal service thing, it just seems to to have settled, you know. But but who knows? It it, it, it can be so erratic, and it seems like we're always just one um, uh, Washington Post headline away from another from another Trump tweet. So Ben, on that note, what do we know about this meeting? We got about 40 companies from all kinds of sectors, some of those uh, high tech sectors, of course, but lots of industry that is going to be kind of implementing this AI. And the message that they're hearing just right about now from the White House is, look, we are not rushing in to regulate what you guys are doing. Go out there, develop. Uh, I think the quote was, we didn't cut the first phone lines before Alexander Graham Bell made the first phone call. Now, we're a little bit past that, but that is the message that they're hearing. So what are we expecting them to talk about, especially with regards to U.S. competitiveness when it comes to other countries like China? Uh, well, I think, you know, uh, China is in a lot of ways uh, sort of the thing animating this whole conference. It's a little unclear to me how much that's going to be the focus of these individual breakout sessions. The agenda focuses more on uh, applications in particular sectors like energy or logistics. But I think there's no question that the White House is really feeling pressure here uh, to make sure that, that America stays competitive. We feel uh, that we're first, but, but I think the, the, the pressure that you and I hear a lot from industry is we're worried that we're going to lose our advantage in just the coming years. Spencer, when it comes to AI in particular, talk about what Amazon might be pushing for here, you know, with respect to other tech companies like Google and Facebook and Apple. Well, I think Amazon in particular, they, they really want to want to steer the conversation toward how AI is beneficial and get it away from this notion of, you know, job killing robots and, and, and that sort of thing. And in particular, I think what they're going to want to do is uh, try to impress upon the government of uh, 
the need for AI in healthcare and healthcare innovation. So they have uh, a lot of cloud solutions that are being embraced by uh, healthcare startups and healthcare technology companies. And I think they're really going to try to, and, and that's an area that will be subject to, uh, to heavy government scrutiny and regulation. So I think in that, in that part, they're going to really try to make a message of how AI can be used to save lives, prolong lives, uh, reduce healthcare costs, so those sorts of things. Ben, talk to us about the state of AI regulation or lack thereof, because part of the problem is that real regulation could be years away if it happens, right? I think that's exactly right. I think almost everybody I've talked to, Democrats, Republicans, people in industry, people in academia, they say this is years away. What I think a lot of these companies are looking for is two things. The first thing is uh, standards. How good does the AI need to be? What, is it, what does it need to do? And the other thing they're looking for is to understand how the current regulatory environment. Uh, now, Spencer mentioned the regulations in healthcare, things like HIPAA, that's the, the healthcare privacy law. How is that going to apply if AI is making decisions about your health or, or aiding in a diagnostic. I think what the industry really wants to know right now is how exactly to think about those issues before they look at any kind of new broad-based AI regulation act. So, you know, you know so much about how much these companies are lobbying Congress, what they are asking for, what kind of money they are spending. Talk to us about how lobbying efforts have changed or evolved over the last year under the Trump administration. Uh, well, I think you see this really interesting uh, aspect of lobbying the Trump administration. There are a lot of people who go straight to the White House in a way that they didn't, even under President Obama, who certainly had a lot of uh, friends in the tech sector. But you see these companies uh, increasingly going to the White House, increasingly going to uh, the vice president's office. So I, I think that's a major issue. You, of course, are always seeing uh, increasing spending in these things. But the other thing you're seeing is they're sort of going to the White House and they're looking at these core issues, uh, AI, regulation uh, training is a huge place where uh, I think the White House and technology really get together even as you're seeing those things that Spencer was talking about the Washington Post tweets and the concern that the you know tech and uh, the White House are going head to head on issues like immigration or other social policies. All right Ben Brody who covers lobbying for us on Capitol Hill as well as Bloomberg Spencer Soper in Seattle. Thank you so much. Speaking of AI, it was the phone call that was supposed to be a watershed moment for Google. Take a listen. See how may I hear you? Hi, um, I'd like to reserve a table for Wednesday the 7th. For seven people? Um, it's for four people. Four people when? Um, Day, next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Sounds innocuous, right? Well, that call was between a real-life restaurant and a not-so-real-life Google AI assistant called Duplex, the program calling for a table complete with ums and hums and pauses of a real-life human. But tech watchers haven't all enjoyed it. Zainab Tafuki, a professor and frequent tech critic, tweeted th that it was horrifying. Author Stuart Brand wrote that these robotic voices should always sound, quote-unquote, synthetic instead of human as this could lead to a destruction of trust. This has led to calls for programs like Duplex to identify themselves before booking future dining reservations. Coming up, BlackBerry's second act CEO John Chen joins us on the company's move from hardware to software next. And later this hour, Apple taps Goldman Sachs to issue its new co-branded credit card. Why the tech giant is moving away from Barclays, this is Bloomberg. In the last few weeks, three self-driving or semi-autonomous cars have crashed in the United States involving Uber, Waymo and Tesla vehicles. Two people have been killed and new questions are being asked about whether driverless cars can actually live up to their hype, hype and be safe without a driver engaged at the wheel. BlackBerry is in the midst of its second act moving away from hardware into software and a big part of its future is in automotive technology, but CEO John Chen of BlackBerry thinks new safety discussions around self-driving cars are irrational. He joins me now here in the studio. So what is irrational about it? What's irrational about the... the Conversations the, the, around self-driving cars. Well, in fact, uh, this idea that 
Well, as long as they have a driver at the wheel, then they're safe. Uh, right. So, so that defeats the whole reason of having a car being self-driven. Um, so, so I, I, I found it, you know, all, almost uh, laughable to talk about why don't we put a, a, a passenger or put a person there to manage a self-driven vehicle? I mean, what, is, what does that mean uh, altogether? So, so I think most of all the fatality or accidents are caused by humans today. Right? Um, as I pointed out in some of my writings, you know, over a, a, a billion. Um, yeah. 1.3 million fatalities every year around the world, 50 million people getting hurt, and 90% of that is because of people, people's errors, human errors. So, so I think we need to perfect the technology rather than saying, okay, let's just do a patchwork and put a, put a, uh, a, a driver in the car to manage a self-driven car. I mean, I, it, it just sounds funny to me. Clearly the technology isn't safe enough yet, but not having a driver there at all sounds a lot scarier. True. Um, so, first of all, let's, let's, let's talk about the big picture a little bit. Um, it's never good to have fatality, um, especially when self-driven car. Um, and uh, but they, they, the statistics shown that um, today's car, although self-driven car, although still very unsafe, so to speak. On, on the other hand, um, you know, it saves a lot of lives. So, uh, you know, let's say if we cut the the fatality down by, by half. It, it, that's 650,000 people every year save their lives. And so I think we ought to focus on making the technology safer than arguing about some kind of a, you know, a, a stopgap solutions for now and so forth. If it takes longer, it takes longer, but you just have to go full steam ahead on the safety and security side. So is the ideal to not have drivers in there at all, to have the systems be safe enough so drivers aren't in there at all? And do you think even if they are supposedly that safe, the driver sh there should be no driver in the car? That do not need human intervention. Yes, I, I will hope that's the case. Can we get there? Yes, it will. It might not be 2020 that everybody dream of, or 2021, 2025. You know, people will talk about that. Uh, that the different manufacturers talk about when they're going to release the car. I think you know we should take our time to get, as the technology sector should, and the automotive sector should take our time to get it right. You also think that there are privacy concerns. Yeah, yeah. So, so one of the argument was doing some monitoring. Um, uh, you know, driver monitoring there. Uh, you know, I, I think that's also a, a, a deep privacy concern. I mean, every time you put data on an accessibility, uh, whether it's on the internet or telematics or whatever it might be, it, it creates that that hole. Um, I mean, it's been <laughs> it's been talked about big time in the last three to six months. I and I think that's also a, a, a area of concern. But I'm still back to the original thing. You know, it is a great idea. Is uh, you know, is is a is a when not is a if. Where, where the car will be driven by himself safely. Uh, it will not be zero accidents, but I, we hope that we'll cut down the majority of auto fatality. Okay, so uh, the president of Audi of America, Scott Keogh, had this to say about regulation, which I do want to ask you about. Take a listen. You do need a federal standard because that'll get away from a lot of this each state's coming up with different initiatives and how they work towards it. But clearly, Caution is the name of the game because you're talking about people's yeah. lives. That's what we've always said, and that's what we will continue to say. What would you like to see happen with regulation? I think, I think first of all, um, I'm, I'm a big time making sure the private sectors ourselves regulate ourselves first. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's up to us to develop standards that ISO will adopt. Um, you know, uh, uh, center bodies will adopt. We will self-regulate ourselves first, and then have a, a partnership relationship with the government, like whether it's Department of Transportation or it might be whoever they might the agency is, and to create a standard that establish a minimum safety standard, so so the consumer could trust it. And so that that's what we we like to see happen. So talk to me about BlackBerry's role in this conversation because your software is now installed in 60 million cars, Honda, Subaru, GM, BMW. What's your role here? Well, we provide components, software components, and we used to provide uh, infotainment system. Now we branch into clusters, advanced driver assist, safety stuff, mm -hmm. um, and and that's our role. That's our role. We 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 made the reality. We make the connected car and the autonomous car a reality. We help de develop that. What do you think the opportunities are? Because software is presumably only going to become more 
powerful in cars themselves as this shift happens? Oh, yeah. Um, the opportunity is obviously huge. Um, if you think about, uh, it, this is not only about cars, it's about anything autonomous. You know, this, this is the marriage in the future of analytics, robotics, big cloud, big data, uh, security. Um, you know, we're focused on solving some problems like how do we make sure that the car, when you develop it, is secure leaving the factory? And then how do you make sure the car, while being used, is not being uh, you know, virusly attacked? Right? So, so there are multiple facets of the life cycle uh, that need security and safety. And so I, it's, 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 uh, it's a huge ongoing opportunities. There are so many companies chasing these opportunities, you know, including all the car makers. Do you think we're going to see M&A here? And if so, how? Um, there are a lot of companies, big and small, working on it. Uh, you know, and uh, unavoidably, sometime in the future, uh, that will be, you know, a kind of so-called consolidation of the market. Yes, I, I do see M&A, but I don't think it's as immediate as most people think. I think the tier ones are quite powerful right now, mm -hmm. uh, and they're pretty involved. Are the tier ones, you know, Google and Tesla, or, you know, GM oh. and Ford? Interesting. Uh, no, you, you, the, the traditional tier ones are the Harman, the LG, the Panasonic, the Denso of the world. Um, um, so, uh, by the Bosch, uh, those are the tier one. Um, and and it's, the, gradually, the manufacturer themselves starting to become their, their, their own tier one in some area. So, so that we know, a ca autonomous car, just a car, we haven't even got into the whole discussion of planes and drones and mm. everything else. Just a car is 100 million lines of code. Humongous, and and so this is a computer on wheels, um, you know, um, on the move. Maybe that's a better way to say. It. So, if a company is to to win or to dominate, I mean, who has a better chance, the tech giants or the car manufacturers? I still believe it's the well. I would like to see a collaboration, but it's going to be the car manufacturer will have a big big say in it. All right. While you're here, I have to ask: any updates on your lawsuits, uh, Facebook and Snap? You've sued them for infringing on your messaging patents. Well, number one, you want, <laughs> number one, you know that I can't comment on, on ongoing lawsuit. And number two, all these things takes a very long time. Okay. John Chen, CEO of BlackBerry, thank you very much for joining us. Always thank you for having you me. On the show. Coming up, we stay on auto technology and speak with Uber CEO Dara Khosra Shahi. We're going to head to the Uber Elevate Summit in LA coming up next. And Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology. Be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok. This is Bloomberg. Snap CEO Evan Spiegel is claiming the top spot in an elite group of corporate leaders. Spiegel received a half billion dollar pay package for 2017 when Snap went public last year. That makes him the highest paid executive of a publicly traded U.S. company, according to the Bloomberg Pay Index. The top 10 all work in private equity or technology and receive compensation exceeding $100 million. Only four women cracked the top 100 of that index. Well, Uber hopes to get its self-driving project back on track soon. Testing was halted in March when its self-driving car hit and killed a pedestrian near Phoenix. CEO Dara Khosra Shahi spoke with Bloomberg Tech's Brad Stone about the program in an onstage interview at the Uber Elevate Summit in Los Angeles. I think for us, it, it really brought home this idea that safety has to come first. Uh, and as it relates to that, that tragedy, we have grounded our, our autonomous fleet uh, and that was a decision that we made. Any sense for when you'll start driving again? It, it'll be within the next few months. I don't know. And, and, and the time will be right when the time is right because we are doing a top to bottom safety review, both internally and with independent uh, folks coming in to take a look at our culture, our practices, et cetera, so that when we get back on the road, we all know as a team that we're getting back on the road in as safe a way as possible and responsible way as, as possible. And, and it just kind of, it, it's just one more way that it hits home how important safety is and how important it is for us to engage with our regulatory partners and the various uh, aeronautics players, et cetera, who have 
played this game and I've worked in a safe environment for a very, very long time and, and have established you know, a long track record of success here. We, we've got to learn here. Can you tell us anything about the status of the NTSB investigation? Uh, it's ongoing. Uh, we have been working hand in hand with them and we've been giving them all the data that they need. Uh, we will not be tweeting ahead of their findings. <laughs> yes, yeah. Elon, take note. Um, well, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know what you're talking <laughs> right. about. Right. Uh, there have been media reports that you know th that this was a group that was moving fast, in part to impress you, to meet some benchmarks and deadlines by the end of the year. What do you take away from that as you move forward in ATG, and also as you set these very ambitious goals that we've heard about here for Uber Elevate? Uh, you can't sacrifice safety. Uh, now, there, there are. That's easy to say, right? There are trade-offs in life. Uh, and I do think that you have to be aware of unintended consequences in everything that you do. Uh, and there's a balance, which is you want to push teams to be ambitious. You want to push them to innovate at the fringes. You want to get teams to be uncomfortable. But at the same time, you really have to check yourself and go back to first principles uh, and ask yourself, you know, are we doing the right thing? Um, are we pushing too hard, and is it coming at the, at the cost of safety? Uh, and, and if it is, then, then you have to take a step back. Um, you know, one of the unique characteristics of Uber is that we are at a core technology company. That, that is our root. That's gonna, that's, you know, we will win because of the talent of the technical people that we have uh, uh, in, in, in our offices. But what makes us different as a technology company is that we don't just deal in, in bits and bytes. We're at this intersection of the digital and the physical world. And it's hard enough to create a delightful digital experience, push a button and something happens. But what's harder is when you push a button and a car shows up. And you know traffic can get in the way. Uh, a driver may decide to do something else. Or when you push a button and a burger shows up. To, to make that experience delightful, dependable, affordable uh, is, is a very, very big challenge. Uh, and, and that's where kind of this, this uh, idea of being a company that pushes forward, uh, uh, and a company that challenges the status quo, but then understands that we don't just live in the digital world, we also live in the physical world, and that comes with compromises and that comes with responsibilities that we, we've got to be aware of. That was Uber CEO Dara Khosra Shahi speaking with Bloomberg's Brad Stone. Coming up, Robinhood is taking aim at one of Wall Street's oldest industries, the brokerage firm. Robinhood's worth now more than $5 billion after its latest funding round. We're going to hear from the co-founder, Baiju Bhatt, next. This is Bloomberg. Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. In just a few short years, Robinhood has grown from fintech startup to a powerhouse shaking up the brokerage industry. In its latest funding round, it's raised more than $363 million, valuing the startup at $5.6 billion. Meantime, its brokerage accounts have doubled to more than $4 million. For more on where the company goes from here, we are joined by Robinhood co-founder and co-CEO, Beiju Bhatt. So, a lot of change, a lot of product launches over the last 12 months. What's next? What's in the product pipeline? So a lot of things are in the product pipeline. It's been really exciting to see the company go from 2015 when we first launched and we were, you know, I think rightfully a stock trading app to today more of a full featured investment platform. Um, this is a huge round of financing and a huge vote of confidence for the business and I think you'll see us go from being a full featured investment platform to a full featured financial services consumer finance. Company. Talk to me about how you compare now to some of the more established players like E-Trade. So yeah, we're excited to see our growth has been pretty staggering over the last year. We've doubled the number of accounts. So we've for the first time crossed E-Trade in terms of number of actual brokerage accounts. Uh, we've got over 4 million people using the platform to E-Trade's about 3.7 million. And the really amazing part of this is that our company is still incredibly lean and efficient with a little under 200 employees versus E-Trade, which has about 3,500 people. And even during this time, we've launched you know, 
three major new updates to the, to the product. Okay, so they have a market cap of about $15 billion right now. Do you see becoming a company that, of that size or even surpassing them when it comes to profitability? I think all those things are in the future for us. I think right now the focus is on building really great products, making sure more and more people use it, and kind of letting our mission guide a lot of our decisions, which is pretty straightforward. It's just to make the financial system more accessible, make it easier for people, independent of how much money they have, to be able to be a part of it. So would you ever launch consumer finance products like bank accounts, a credit card, retirement options? You know, all things that we're looking at. I think the real question for us, though, to ask is that if we launch any one of these products, how can we make it so much better than what's out there, the sort of 10x threshold that people talk about, so that if you were to put what we had right next to what's out there right now, a consumer couldn't reasonably choose what's out there right now without being like, wow, I think I just made a mistake. So what's to stop an E-Trade or a Schwab from offering trading for free at a very low cost? I mean, they've already lowered their fees significantly. Yeah. I think it's a very different business. It's a fundamentally different cost structure. I think while it's theoretically possible that they could do such a thing, I don't think it would make very much sense for their business or their customer base. And I think, you know, as more time goes by, like we become a more credible company and we become much more established. And I think that, you know, we're pretty happy where we are. So we've been talking a lot about data, data mm -hmm. privacy. Do you ever sell customer data? We do not. Do you ever foresee selling customer data? We do not. <laughs> Does anyone have access to customer data? So we are a very tightly regulated financial institution. We work with the SEC, with FINRA, with the Treasury Department, you name it, we work with them. And there's some pretty strict guidelines on how we deal with customer data. And so we're pretty tightly bound by that stuff. We share it with the regulators on, on an as-needed basis, but we're very, very serious about security at our company. Um, and I think we're doing a pretty, very, very good job at it, given that we're a technology company that from the ground up can actually build an engineering solution to this. So out. no hedge funds, no marketing agencies no. can see it. I want to talk to you about crypto because you're now, Robinhood Crypto is now available in 10 states. Mm -hmm. um, Bill Gates just said he would short crypto if he could. He would short Bitcoin if he could. Mm -hmm. Warren Buffett called it rat poison squared. So you've got established investors and businessmen out there saying this could be a house of cards. I think that there's a lot of potential with crypto. Mm -hmm. I think the future is a place where crypto is going to be a really substantial part of it. I think there's still a lot of work that we need to do and the broader crypto industry needs to do to build really meaningful use cases for it in society. I think right now it's functioning as an effective store of value, um, but I don't think that's what it's gonna end up being. I think it's gonna be much more than that. And so, so is Warren Buffett wrong? Is Bill Gates wrong? Is that I mean, I'm saying? not gonna come on here and say these people are wrong, <laughs> um, but I think that the future holds a lot of really interesting stuff for it. So. How are we going to see your crypto products then evolve, given the uncertainty, potential regulation? So the regulation is something that we're, we're very well accustomed to, to doing. We're already established as a broker-dealer. We work with all the regulators uh, pretty regularly. I think we, we welcome more regulation. I think that that will actually be something that makes it more stable and makes it more useful for people. Um, I think you'll continue to see our product evolve. I think first order of business for us is to get it out to everyone. Once we get there, we're gonna start taking a look at how we can do things like support more coins, make it available in more interesting use cases, but TBD. Now, you know, you guys launched as a sort of startup for millennials, and obviously now you've got four million accounts. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about the demographics of your user base and how you see those evolving? Continues to be a younger uh, part of the American population. I think we foresee this being um, kind of our core demographic for the foreseeable future. There's something like 75 million people in this demographic, and I think our goal as a company is over the long haul to have a meaningful impact on wealth distribution, and the place to start is with the younger audience for that. Do you so. want to attract um, some of these more sort of established investors or older investors? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So. We're in a very uncertain time mm -hmm. politically. Um, there's been a lot of volatility in the markets. How does that impact your view on the road ahead? I mean, trade wars, I mean, there's so much going on. Yeah. 
I think I've heard one very good piece of advice on how to think about this is that at all points in time, their black, black swans are flying around. They don't land that often. Um, I think we. These are really big black swans right they, now. Yeah. A trade are. war. Yeah. All, all very reasonable. I think um, we're going to do our part to make sure our systems work really well, whatever happens. I think long term, the US economy is going to do really well. And I think the fact that we have such a young audience using our product is really interesting in this capacity. Because if you're investing today and you're 25, 27, 30 years old, your retirement's a long time away. And your need to have liquidity for that purpose isn't in the next five years. OK. So, so when's the IPO? Uh, good question. Um, Right now, we've still got a lot more business building to do. It's something that we're, we're certainly thinking about. Um, but we'll have to leave it at that. All right. Beiju Bot, co-founder and co-CEO of Robinhood, thank you so much thank for you. stopping by. OK, coming up, the public now can see thousands of Facebook posts backed by Russia aimed to ramp up political discord in the US in 2016. What we have learned from these ads and what does it mean for elections to come? This is Bloomberg. More than 3,000 Russian-backed Facebook ads were made public for the first time by Democrats on the House Intelligence Committee. The disclosure gives new insight into the techniques Russians use to create discord leading up to the 2016 presidential elections and data on how many people they reached. I want to bring in Bloomberg Tech's Sarah Fryer, who covers Facebook for us, and Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde, live in London. So, uh, Sarah, I want to start with you. Um, what did we learn from seeing these ads that we didn't know before? These ads... It you, we before we had just a few examples we had a handful of them now we have more than 3500 of them and for me just going through each and every one that i went through when th when this was released it was just an incredible demonstration of russia's financial investment in stirring up controversy in the united states this is this was not a big campaign if you compare it to the campaigns of hillary clinton or donald trump this was a drop in the bucket for facebook but it went undetected, and it's so interesting to see uh, people pitted against each other for gun rights, immigration, race relations, all of these issues that are sort of, you know, fault lines in American society really exposed by Russia. Uh, Carol, you know, obviously Facebook has a lot of work to do when it comes to its relationship with lawmakers around the world in the U.S. and especially in the U.K. You know, how does this new information change that? Yeah, I think this will be food for thought for the politicians here in the United Kingdom. There's been an ongoing investigation as to whether social media in general was used to perhaps manipulate the outcome of the EU referendum here in the UK, the Brexit vote. Notably, Facebook has continued to say that only one dollar, just one dollar, was spent by Russians in advertising around the Brexit vote here in the UK but some politicians have just felt that that was pretty hard to believe when the CTO was up in front of lawmakers a couple of weeks ago here in the UK of Facebook Mike the Shrepf as you guys call him Mike Mike Shrepfer, he was saying actually look we we still think it's one dollar we might have missed something but notably this is something that they're going to be focusing on I think it's interesting that just yesterday we saw Google and indeed Facebook have both tried to step in and ensure that there isn't any money missing spent on around the Irish vote on abortion. This is a referendum going on in Ireland and they're worried about the manipulation of that vote and they've banned any foreign buyers of advertising around that. That's what Google has actually banned any advertising around that vote. So clearly it's something that politicians this side of the Atlantic are, are concerned about. Sarah, obviously we, we've talked about how the primaries have already kicked off in some states. You know, what does this mean for the elections coming up this year? Well, I think what I want to underscore is that the, the paid part of this effort is a small part. That's the illegal part. Foreign uh, officials are not supposed to interfere in our elections. But it was a small part of this larger campaign by Russia to influence U.S. politics. 150 million people on Facebook and Instagram saw posts from Russia at some point. So 
Is that going to continue? Are there safeguards in place at Facebook to prevent it from getting really bad? What they're doing with ads, is this going to also be uh, really well implemented with regards to fake news, with regards to some of the other tools that Russia has been using to uh, stir up trouble in society? And we've seen it happen with, with mass shootings, fake news gets spread, that has been linked to Russia. It is constant, and these companies are coming up with solutions, but will they come up with them fast enough to really impact the election. And you actually have a new story out today about how terrorism is increasingly creeping up on Facebook. Right, so this company, they see these issues like terrorism, like foreign election manipulation, and it's kind of a whack-a-mole problem. And what we've discovered is even though Facebook's getting better, their artificial intelligence is getting better at identifying ISIS and Al-Qaeda terrorism propaganda, there are still posts from so many other terrorism groups, U.S.-designated terrorism groups, that are easily searchable on Facebook. We found them, we sent them to Facebook, they took some of them down. But this is just another example of how the company needs to be more proactive about looking for the things that could be a problem problem for its users. And of course, Caroline, this has global implications with, with, with global elections and, and potentially mm. uh, roots to some of these problems in other countries. Yeah, and I think here, it, also other social media platforms, as you say, perhaps advertising hasn't been spent, but bots have certainly been at work when it comes to perhaps the vote on the particularly to do with the general election that was held here in the UK. There's been reporting by the Sunday Times here in the United Kingdom that Russia was helping focus potentially attention on the Labour Party here, which is the opposition party. It was claimed that some 6,500 Russian Twitter accounts were alive and active backing the Labour politician and Labour rather than the Conservative Party that has currently been in, part in, in power. So there is clearly a concern about elections going forward. This is why we're seeing such significant increase in regulation, particularly here in the EU. We're seeing the GDPR, the General Data Protection, coming into force come May the 25th. This is about data privacy, but also focus is now being a shun on the issue about elections, about the manipulation of them, and certainly it's something that people keep on investigating more and more this side of the Atlantic. All right, Caroline, hang on. I do want to ask you about something else. Goldman Sachs is teaming up with Apple to create a new credit card. The move will replace Apple's longstanding rewards card partnership with Barclays. And Caroline, this has huge implications for the fintech industry, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think this is an interesting choice that they're going with Goldman rather than Barclays. Notably, Goldman has really been building its presence in the fintech space in particular. And remember, they've really been trying to build through the Marcus unit, which was their area of expertise. And now they're going to be launching this new product. We don't know exactly how the product's going to unfold. We understand that they're still formulating it. But if you look at what that Apple did with Barclays in the past, you'd basically get points with your credit card if you spent on Apple products. So you'd get perhaps, you know, one point per dollar spent with, with uh, well, three points, in fact, every dollar spent with an Apple product, two points per dollar spent with restaurants, one point per dollar spent with other purchases. So this is about rewarding the customer. This is about Goldman Sachs in particular wanting to get more in bed with the consumer in particular, go down that route of fintech with its Marcus unit, and really try to also team up with Apple going forward. I think it's interesting when you see also Apple wanted to focus in on the consumer with payments. They've got Apple Pay. I was reading, and it surprised me, that actually not that many merchants actually accept Apple Pay thus far, only about, what I think, about a third, and, and PayPal is in bed with about two-thirds of, of all merchants out there. So still, Apple has a way to go to really start claiming the fintech badge of its own and start to make inroads on PayPal, particularly with peer-to-peer -peer payments as well. All right, Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde and Sarah Fryer, thank you both. Coming up. Google Back GV is adding its first female investing partner. We're going to hear from her next. This is Bloomberg. has announced a new celebrity partner. Chrissy Teigen is hopping on board. She will bring six recipes to the Blue Apron menu, including recipes from her cookbook, Cravings, which is actually very good. Recipes will be available June 4th to July 9th. Well, Jessica Verrilli is headed back to Google Back 
venture capital firm GV. After basically overseeing every Twitter acquisition in the company's history, she's starting a new chapter as GV's only female general partner. This may seem familiar because back in 2015, she actually left Twitter for a brief stint at GV and ultimately went back to Twitter until December of last year. So why return? Jess really joins me now here in the studio. So you've actually gotten a promotion. You were an investing partner before. Now you're a general partner. Why GV again? Thank you for having me, Emily. <laughs> I'm delighted to be a general partner at GV. I think it's uh, a tremendous platform and a really differentiated platform to be investing with. First, the role of an investor is really to support and back founders through the whole life cycle of their journey. That's work I love to do, and I've done it as an acquirer and an active angel investor. Now, GV in particular is differentiated because of its scale. It's an enormous platform, allowing it to back founders through Series A, Series B, and beyond. Mm -hmm. It has technology and the DNA of the firm, which is an incredible expertise to lend to founders, but also lets us innovate in the way we do the business. And third, culturally, it's a place I'm really excited to be a part of. I will tell you, I was previously at the firm, decided to go back to Twitter uh, when Jack became the permanent CEO and called and asked me to be a part of the next chapter. And I've always answered the call for founders, and I love building companies. You can tell the culture of a company or a firm in the way it treats employees on the way out. And David Crane, who runs the firm, said, we support you in your journey of continuing to build the startup, but just let us be the first phone call when you want to come back into the business. So what does it mean being a general partner versus an investing partner? You know, how much more power, check writing power, decision making power do you have? Mm -hmm. The difference between a partner and a general partner at GV is just a matter of experience. The investing partner role is a check writing role. When I was previously in the job, I played a key role in our investment in Medium. Mm -hmm. Another investing partner on the team, Laura Milan, recently led the firm's $34 million investment in Outdoor Voices. So the firm is nearly 50% women and has four women in investing roles, which is just over 20%. There's more work to do there. Right, um, you're still the only female general partner right now, which is not unlike many venture capital firms. So there's more work to do and I'm excited to work with my colleagues to continue that. So given that you saw almost every acquisition in Twitter's history, what are some untapped opportunities out there that you already know about, specific opportunities that other people may not? So I think it's an incredible time to be investing in technology companies. There are many trends that excite me, but two in particular I'm particularly excited about. The first, machine learning and AI. At Twitter, we did three acquisitions to bring that incredibly unique talent into the company because we knew how transformative it could be on the core product, and that has played out. If you look broadly at the landscape, I started my career in venture 10 years ago. And in that moment, iPhone and Android had just launched. It created an incredible open space for new products and companies, Twitter, Instagram, Square, many others. Machine learning and AI is that moment for us right now. It is a wide open space to reimagine and invent every industry. Flatiron Health, which is a company in the GV portfolio, uses machine learning and AI to help us understand how we treat and uh, identify cancer. It's a company Roche just acquired for almost $2 billion. The applications are really endless. In addition, I'm excited about crypto. I'm spending a ton of my time in that space to explore and understand, particularly why the most brilliant technical minds in my network who could work anywhere, want to work in crypto. So what is it about that that holds so much promise and potential? And that's another area I'm really excited so about. So Bill Gates just said he would short Bitcoin if he could. Warren Buffett called it rat poison squared. Thoughts? Uh, crypto is an incredible amalgamation of many different um, entrepreneurs, innovation, and on one hand, there is a part of that space that is about get rich quick, mm -hmm. and there are scams, and they're not wrong. Mm -hmm. There are aspects of the space um, that are uninteresting or distasteful or even fraudulent. Mm. There's also a part of the space that has a sort of anarchist or libertarian narrative to it, depending upon your background that may or may not appeal to you. But there is another part of that space which is about technology, and it's about the open source software movement and how groups of people around the world can collaborate to build networks. 
and about decentralization, that's the thread that to me is most exciting and that's the area I'm excited to continue to explore with entrepreneurs. Now, you've been angel investing on the side with Hashtag Angels for several years now. How are you going to separate that from your work at GV? So my investing will be focused on GV, but I will continue to build angels, which is something I co-founded with five other women three years ago. Particularly, I will be focused on supporting our mission to get more women on the cap tables of successful startups in Silicon Valley. In addition to investing, we've built a program we call Angels Access, which has brought together hundreds of women in the industry to talk about investing, to explore spaces like crypto. Just three weeks ago, we had an event with 250 people, uh, with eight of nine speakers, women on stage, to talk about these new frontiers. So my investing and the vast majority of my time will be focused on my core responsibilities at GV, but I will be continuing to further our mission of Angels, and the firm is really supportive of that. All right, Jessica Farrelly. General partner, new general partner at GV. Thank you so much Thank you. for joining us. We'll keep our eye on you. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. On tomorrow's show, we're going to be speaking with John Doerr, Kleiner Perkins, Caulfield, Byers. That is all for now. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.